I, I want to thank everybody for coming. This is one of our, uh, the first event that we're having here at Google, which in addition to being here and sent to a number of other offices is also viewable on your desktop computer using some new Google software. So if you're online and you're using it, let us know how well that system works. Um, for a long time, uh, I've hoped that we would be graced, I think, with the, the presence of somebody who I believe um, may be the single most important, if not the one or two most important people in global politics in the last century. Um, Dr. Kissinger is, is an interesting person in that he escaped from Nazi Germany in 1938, moved to New York and to the United States, uh, brilliant professor at Harvard, uh, tapped by President Nixon initially as National Security Advisor and then as Secretary of State. And for those of you who were not paying attention then or not even born, I can tell you that the phenomena of Dr. Kissinger during that period was a sight to behold. His, his work ethic, his impact, the media obsession, and his German charm created a phenomena that's not unlike what you see today with our presidential candidates, as he set out with an agenda that has shaped much of the world that we see today. Um, it's, I think, with great honor that we have Dr. Kissinger joining us here on stage. Well, Dr. Kissinger and Mr. Secretary, welcome to Google. Um, I wanted to start with some questions about things which happened when I was growing up, and then maybe we could evolve to your view of the global political situation today and some of your insights and so forth. Um, I wanted to start by asking, frankly, about President Nixon. Here's a president who was enormously controversial ultimately left office. Um, you worked with him very closely. You were never part, caught up in any way in any of the Watergate issues. And you were able to change the world during his presidency. What was your relationship with President Nixon like? Can I make a general comment? Of course. First, uh, first, uh, let me thank you for inviting me here. And in order to understand me, you should treat me like an inventor of the Gutenberg Bible treated a medieval monk who came tottering out of his monastery and said, you're having huge implications in the world. I don't quite know what they are. <laughs> and. Uh, that's how I fell into dialogue with Eric at various uh, uh, seminars. Uh, compared to what you people are doing, what I do with modern technology is a disgrace. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I don't use email. Uh, I don't text message. Uh, I read, I use Google to read newspapers around the world and occasionally get a bit of in information. And <laughs> now I'm telling you, that's why I have no right to be here in some <laughs> respects. And I, uh, I have some views about the relationship between information and knowledge and then between knowledge and wisdom, and they're sort of general philosophical views. And this is how we fell into, uh, into conversation. Uh, so I'm very impressed by what you do. I, uh, I'm asking myself always, where will it go? Not where will it go in terms of what you do, but in terms of impact 
on society and how it will get used. This is my personal reason for being here and to learn. But Eric and I thought it might be helpful for you to, to hear some of the uh, answers to the sort of question you asked. Because sometimes the collection of information doesn't give you the context mm -hmm. or the motive or the history. So it's in that sense that I'll answer. And I will try to give it in a context so that it isn't just what did you think of Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to understand my relationship to Richard Nixon, you have to understand that I never met him before he appointed me. Uh, sort of a little bit like how we hire people at Google. Not only, <laughs> not only had I never met him, I was the foreign policy advisor to Nelson Rockefeller, uh -huh. and we, we spent three campaigns trying to defeat Nixon. <laughs> and we did so by, and we failed each time because we were backward in our perception on how candidates are selected. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller thought that you become a candidate by having the best program. So he spent three evenings a week and every Sunday studying issues. Uh, no serious candidate today would waste his time <laughs> on such an effort. <laughs> and so we were terrific on issues, or at least we thought we were terrific on issues, while Nixon was collecting delegates. And we'd arrive at the convention with some pitiful number of delegates. And it, for some, one reason or another, we failed each time. So you have to start it. Secondly, from 1961 to 1962, I worked in the Kennedy White House as a consultant to Kennedy and Bundy and his group on the uh, Berlin crisis of that time. So uh, if anyone had said to me in 1967, you'll be the national security advisor of Richard Nixon. I would have said that's insane. I mean, it can't happen. Then, just to give you some, you don't understand Richard Nixon unless you understand that one, he was a very brilliant man. Secondly, he was a very insecure man. Uh, so, the first time I met Nixon, the first time I met him, I was invited to see him after he was elected president in the Pierre Hotel in uh, New York. And we had a two-hour conversation, at the end of which I didn't know what he wanted. <laughs> so uh, I knew he wanted something, uh, and I'd be offered something, but I didn't know what it was, so I went back to Harvard. A week later, John Mitchell, whom you, who became later Attorney General, called me up and said, uh, well, are you going to take the job or not? <laughs> I said, what job? <laughs> he, said, he said, oh my god, he screwed it up again. <laughs> uh, 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 so uh, then I was called in. This time, uh, he did offer me the job, unambiguously. And I uh, did something the Harvard people here will understand, it, unbelievable arrogance. I told him, you know, I've been opposing you for 12 years. And I would like to consult my friends for a week before I give you an answer. To which he should have said, get lost. I've just offered you the third most important job in the government. But he said, take, take the job. 
Yeah, he said, take a week. And it wasn't until I saw Nelson Rockefeller, who was in Latin America when this event occurred two days later, and I told him what had happened. And he said, has it occurred to you that he's taking a bigger chance on you than you on him? <laughs> then I decided <laughs> that was right, I took it. So, <laughs> so when I met Richard Nixon, I knew nothing about him except his public image. And I sort of shared at first the Harvard image uh, of, uh, of Rick, Richard Nixon. The, uh, the reason I was not involved in Watergate uh, was because of the rigid separation in the Nixon White House between foreign policy and domestic policy. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I would have done had I sat in on some of those meetings. Uh, White Houses, and I've seen many since, or had before, are not organized to tackle the president every time he says something that uh, you don't agree with. But I don't know what I would have done. Uh, I'd like to think that I wouldn't. At any rate, I didn't. I wasn't involved. But that's the, the technical reason was that uh, foreign policy was kept strictly separate. And uh, in foreign policy, Nixon had thought about it a lot. He had read about it a lot. And he was a good conceptual thinker. What he did not like to do was face-to-face -face confrontations with anybody who disagreed with him. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean that he would not insist on his views, but it meant that he would not do it directly. Oh. And therefore, for face-to-face -face diplomacy, that was not his forty. but he also he didn't try it very often. So, so the historical record says that you worked unusually well with a president who, had, who was not perfect. And in the 72 election, there was actually a discussion about a secret plan to end the war. Yeah. And that was what the media reported. Um, and then you ultimately were able to achieve, with personal negotiations that were secret, an end to the Vietnam War, for which I personally am internally grateful because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, what was, and of course, you're a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize for that extraordinary work, which you led. Did you conceive of that? Did you call them? Uh, I guess telephones didn't work to North Vietnam at the time. H how did it play out? How did you achieve that? You know, when I ramble on and to long explanations, it's to give you a history and a context. I can give short answers, and if you want them shorter, let me say so. But uh, on the Vietnam, uh, on the Vietnam issue, uh, I did not know what Nixon said during the campaign because I didn't know him during the campaign. I only met him huh. after the campaign. I can tell you what I thought. And it, uh, 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 and my thinking on Vietnam evolved uh, in the following way. My major interest in foreign policy had been Europe. I had not any uh, particular interest in uh, in Asian issues. Uh, when the Vietnam War started, I sort of academically, uh, I, I remember once asking Walt Rustow, who was security advisor, why do you think you can do with 50,000 people, which was the level when Kennedy was there, 
that what the French couldn't do with 150,000. But that was, a, was an academic, non-involved question. Uh, then in 1965, after Kennedy's assassination, when Johnson was president, Ambassador Lodge invited me to, uh, to come uh, to Vietnam. He knew me from the Rockefeller campaign. Uh, and uh, he uh, asked me to look at the political situation in Vietnam. This is 1965. Uh, I came to the view that the way the war was being conducted, uh, uh, could not succeed. Uh, and uh, for a variety of reasons. And uh, therefore thought that some negotiation would have to take place. In retrospect, I was right in my analysis. I was wrong in my solution, even though I'd spent seven years on it. Because when I said negotiation, I thought some compromise, something which separated the political from the military issues. And I did not understand until really afterwards that for the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, who had spent their life uh, uh, as revolutionaries. Uh, a compromise was the same as a defeat. Mm -hmm. uh, they, to them, the basic theory we had, leave, let the people decide, have an election, and we will even accept a communist victory at the polls. That didn't mean anything. Uh, communism was the wave of the future. It was the truth. They had fought for it forever, and to say they should compromise it and jeopardize it in an election. Uh, and so this was the weakness, I would say, in, uh, in, in my thinking. But it dominated my thinking. Then in 1967, when I was a private citizen, I ran at an international conference into a Frenchman who had been, uh, was then working for the World Health Organization, but in whose house Ho Chi Minh had lived when he was in, uh, 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 in Paris for the 1946 negotiations with the French. So I had the brainwave of saying, why don't, why don't you go to Hanoi and talk to Ho Chi Minh? Uh, which only could, I would never, <laughs> today I'd be too smart, I mean too wise, I'd, I'd say this can't work. <laughs> so, uh, so I called up McNamara. I knew the State Department would never go for this. So I called McNamara, who's so vilified by so many, uh, and said, why don't we try this? Huh? Uh, I was nobody. I had no governmental status at that time. And McNamara pushed it, and that Frenchman went, and he brought a letter, and it started a sort of negotiation which the North Vietnamese used to calm us while they were preparing the Tet Offensive. Oh. And, and then they launched uh, the defense. This was my background when I went into government. So I was committed to negotiation. Uh, but, uh, and I left also with the attitude that I thought, and I still think, that what got us into Vietnam was the Kennedy and Johnson administration, not the Nixon administration. And I felt a certain sense of obligation to the people that I had worked with in the Kennedy administration and that I was associated with at Harvard to try to carry out uh, the solution to that problem. Where I then parted company with them was they evolved, say, in 1965, we were together in believing that what was being done wouldn't work and we should try to solve it. 
Then gradually the debate in America moved towards that America was morally wrong and that this reflected a deep flaw in American society and that really it was almost better for America not to succeed because if it succeeded, it would keep doing it. And moreover, when I was at Harvard as a graduate student and a young professor, because I never met a Republican in those days, uh, but uh, and Eisenhower was president and Harvard was not thrilled with Eisenhower. But uh, one talked about the government as a respectable organization that was making mistakes that you would try to correct or influence. In the 60s and then 70s, it developed into the proposition that government was immoral, criminal, lying, uh, pursuing some ulterior motives. And that sort of paralyzed uh, uh, the debate. So when I became security advisor, we tried to follow a strategy in which on the one hand, we tried to demonstrate militarily that Vietnam, that North Vietnamese could not succeed, but give them political options. And when you study it without uh, some of the hysterical writing, you will find that that's about how it evolved. But in the process, it used up a lot of public cohesion. Uh, but by the end of 1972, we had pretty well achieved what we set out to do. And we negotiated an agreement. And when people ask me what was my greatest moment in government, they expect me to say going to China, mm -hmm. negotiating three peace agreements in the Middle East. But for me, the greatest single thrill was when the North Vietnamese accepted the proposals we had made to them six months earlier. And I turned to my close associate, Vincent Lord, when he had said this, and I wrote him a note, and I said, we've done it. Uh, well, it turned out we didn't because we couldn't maintain the cohesion of the country, maybe largely as a result of Watergate, to do what was needed to maintain the agreement. Yeah. But so, this is... Uh, so, so in the middle of all of this, this enormous achievement, for which again you've been honored globally and all of us thank you, you also... I've described what happened, you call it achievement. I, I think it was a well, person. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I think I think the country agrees with me. Uh, in the middle of all of this, you've got you're negotiating with our enemy, right? Secretly and effectively, um, you have all of the turmoil of that. You have an idea, and that idea is now known as Nixon to China. And the the thesis here was that. Here is a staunch Republican, staunch anti-communist, who sees that there's an opportunity to change our interactions, which at the time were with a country that was so reviled that my father had a little red book, which he kept, but he would hide, because he didn't want anyone to know it because it was so interesting. And the history in China in the 60s was of a country that looks nothing like China today. How did you decide to go to China there's a famous picture. We obviously have a large operation now in, in, in China. There's a famous picture of you, President Nixon, and Mao Zedong walking the wall on your first visit. And when you fly into Beijing Airport, people still say that's the terminal where Dr. Kissinger flew his military jet for the secret meetings that opened up China. What was that? Was it your idea? Did you strategize it? Did you think about it? And did it play as you expected? Uh, for people interested in how the ideas develop, this is rather interesting. Nixon and I did not know each other when, uh, before 60, uh, really January 69. Uh, 
Nixon developed the idea that we should open to China oh. in 68. Mm -hmm. I developed the idea that papers I wrote for Rockefeller and speeches Rockefeller gave that I drafted. But they went parallel to each other. They were not, we didn't learn that uh, uh, from each other. Uh, uh, Nixon did it a little more from tactical reasons. I did it partly for the same tactical reasons, but also partly because I thought that with the bitter debate that was going on in this country about the nature of peace in Vietnam, it was important to demonstrate to the American public that we had a concept of peace that was global and that Vietnam was an aberration in the system from that and not the expression of everything that uh, one wanted to do. What actually triggered out, and that's how we entered, and he and I had a number of conversations on that subject, Nixon and I, in the early part of the administration. But uh, this was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution in China, so they had no diplomats abroad. They had pulled back their diplomats. They, they were completely closed, as I they remember. You couldn't go closed. into the country. There was no communication. A 1.3 billion people locked inside right. of the country. And we had uh, only no not only no communication, there was no uh, economic relationship. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was one thing to say, we'd like to do this. Uh, it was another how to do it and how to make the first move. Uh, then in the spring of 69, there were a number of military clashes between the Chinese and Russians in the far reaches of Siberia at something called the Yuzuri River. And we noted that then the Soviets made the mistake of coming in to brief us on this and uh, which they did because they were thinking of attacking China and they had moved. And so as a result of their doing something that they normally didn't do, we started following these events in detail and started plotting them. And I had somebody from the Rand Corporation come to my office and we plotted where these incidents took place and we found that they were close to uh, Soviet railheads and far from Chinese railheads. And we decided that the Chinese might, would not be so stupid as to start military actions close to the supply lines of the enemy and far from their own. So then the idea came and occurred to us, uh, or strength that maybe Russia or Soviets were planning to attack them. So then we started studying their military dispositions and we found that about 40 Soviet divisions were being moved to the Siberian border. So then we energetically began to move on the issue of communicating to China. Uh, and as it turned out, the Chinese did the same thing vis-a-vis -vis us. And how did you find each other? Well, we didn't find each other. We made a lot of, both sides made terrible mistakes. We went to the Romanians, thinking they were communists, but they were communists, but dissident from Moscow. Turned out Mao didn't trust any non-Chinese communists. So uh, that didn't do very well. <laughs> Mao, Mao made the same mistake. He invited Edgar Snow, who was a left-wing, very pro-Chinese writer, to see him, to, to give him an interview. And uh, he told him in that interview that, uh, that he hinted at a visit of Nixon to China. It was a conciliatory interview. First thing that happened, we didn't see the interview for two months because we paid no attention to Snow. <laughs> and and then when, Hard to we, imagine now. <laughs> when we got the interview, we said, oh, this, that's a pro-Chinese leftist. 
if if Mao wanted something, he'd be smarter than to go to Edgar Snow. <laughs> so the so so both sides misfired more or less for the same reason. Uh, so then I won't go through every. Uh, we did a number of things. One was we relieved minuscule restrictions, uh, uh, existing restrictions on economic trade in a minuscule way, such as that American tourists would be permitted to buy $100 worth of Chinese produced goods in Hong Kong, no place <laughs> else. Uh, Which is not part of China anyway at the time. Right, and that was not part of China. We just wanted them to know, uh, and a few State Department people that were Soviet experts were smart enough to pick this up and warned us that if we continued on this route, it meant war with Russia. So uh, we continued. Anyway, we finally uh, asked the Pakistanis, who were friendly to China, no communists, to deliver the message that we wanted to talk. And they did, and then, you know, for people like you, it's unbelievable. We, we would get handwritten messages delivered in Pakistan by a Chinese emissary. Yes. Brought from Pakistan to Washington by another emissary. <laughs> we answered on paper that had no watermarks on it uh, <laughs> that went back the same way. So every exchange took about 10 days. Uh, Would you like to visit? Well, the yes. first exchange was... <laughs> the first Where would you like to visit? The first Your exchange place was, or mine? <laughs> no. First exchange was... Uh, from China, we note that the message from Pakistan, more or less, and it is significant because it is a message from a head, through a head, to a head. <laughs> and so they said, we would be willing to receive an emissary, more or less, uh, to talk about the fate, the future of Taiwan, so we wrote back, uh, we're willing to talk, but only about the whole complex of relationships, and then the, including Taiwan. And this sent got refined through a few more exchanges. And then, and then the rest is history. I, I wanted to ask one, one more question of historical importance that maybe we could, I could ask about today. During the same time, <laughs> Vietnam is being settled by you and your team. China is opened up with the enormous impact it's had. You did one other thing, or set of things, which is that you achieved Middle East peace. Uh, well, not peace, but some progress. And as part of that, on your government jet, you were the only person who could fly between the countries that were at war. And you established, I believe, what is now known as modern shuttle diplomacy where you literally flew every few hours back and forth between the warring countries. How did that play out? Uh, may, may, may I mention uh, one, one other thing, because I think it's important to understand that period and maybe uh, the current and future period. We also while we were opening to China, improved our relations with the Soviet Union. Ah. And we made the first strategic arms control yes, agreement and the missile defense agreement. And the reason I mention it is because our strategy was to position ourselves in such a way that we were closer to Russia and to the Soviet Union and China than they were to each other. So that in every crisis, we had more options than they did. Now, I know this sounds sort of 
heartless. And, uh, but when you conduct long-range policy, you have to look at the motivations and the incentives of the societies you're dealing with. And I mentioned this be before we get to the, to yes. the prelude of the Middle East, because we could not have done in the Middle East what we did, which had been a sort of a Soviet province mm -hmm. and for ever since the 67 war, without having created the incentive in the Soviet Union that they did not want to drive us totally into the Chinese camp. So mm -hmm. their responses were somewhat uh, uh, mitigated. Now, in the Middle East, we had the great good fortune that in Egypt there was a great Arab leader. Yes. Uh, Anwar Sadat. Yes. And uh, he had the courage uh, to, to do the difficult choices. The dilemma of all the sides in the Middle East was that they would state absolute goals which the other side could not accept without injuring its self-respect. And uh, it was especially a problem for the Arabs who considered the Israelis uh, intruders. And it was also a big problem for the Israelis because when you have a very narrow margin of survival in neighbors, uh, avowing their de determination to destroy you, uh, you cannot risk very many brilliant moves that your uh, friends may advise you to do because if you turn out to be wrong, you don't get another chance. But importantly because of Sadat, uh, it was uh, possible to establish a dialogue. Uh, and in the first two agreements that we made, uh, they would not talk to each other. The way the process worked was that each side would state, well, in fact, they negotiated through me, and I, this is why I had to shuttle. L literally, you were negotiating between the two because they couldn't talk to each other? They would give me their position. There were two levels. There was a political level. So they couldn't, like, call each other on the phone? No. There was no communication with them. The way it worked is we would set up the political contact, and I would do that with the respective Arab leaders, Sadat or Assad or Hussein. Uh, I would meet with the Israelis. Uh, then once the negotiation had reached a certain level, uh, in the Egyptian case, a technical group was assembled when the issue was disengagement from the Suez Canal, for example, a military group was assembled to discuss the technicalities of how to do this, but they were always, and they were designed to be half a step behind the political level. They were not authorized to go beyond what Sadat, Golda, and I had already uh, settled. So the shuttle was not really an invention if we had had the internet. computers, internet, we wouldn't have had to do this. But uh, it, it, um, uh, but the precondition for that working was uh, not something you couldn't find on the internet. It was that in that process, uh, uh, confidence developed between the uh, two sides. I, I can give you one example. One of the issues was when the Israelis agreed to withdraw from the Suez Canal, and, the, and so the, when both sides agreed to withdraw 30 miles from the Suez Canal, the question then was, since now that strip technically was Egyptian, how many tanks could they put into that? How many tanks in Tanks, the you know. Uh, so, uh, Golda said 30. 30. And 
my principle was I'll deliver any message once, uh, even if it's ridiculous. So I, <laughs> I brought it. So you to, said Golda says 30. What's your offer? No, I said Golda said 30, whereupon the Egyptian Minister of Defense burst into tears of rage and said, we will never do this. And no Egyptian officer would ever sign this, Mr. President, to Sadat. Sadat said, you go to the next room with me, please. And he said, does she mean it? Mm. I said, no. <laughs> uh, but you have to decide for how many weeks you want to hang in there to bleed increments of 30 out of this process until you get to the final point. So 30, 60, 90, 120. 90. Yeah. So he went in, back into the other room and said, I've accepted 30, Kissinger will get me more, and you'll sign it. Uh -huh. I mean, that's why he was a great man. So I went back to Golda, and I won't go through all the dialogue. She finally agreed to 100. Uh, Whereupon, when I brought that back to Sadat, he said, now let me tell you something. If I want to attack, I'll put a thousand over the canal in one night. But this is a psychological problem, so you go back to Kolda and tell her, I won't put any tanks across the canal. There'll be zero. But she should learn from this to respect the dignity of our people. If that sort of dialogue were possible today, yeah. uh, it'd be much easier to make, uh, uh, to make progress. So he did not, in fact, put the 100 tanks he in? He put not, no tanks across. Yeah. But uh, it was one of these, had he wanted to attack, yeah. the restriction wouldn't have right. been any limitation. So, so one more question, and then we'll go to, to the audience. Um, and let's imagine we're going to have a new president uh, in January. And um, any smart president is going to call you first and ask you your view of the world. Um, <laughs> don't you think? And get some advice. Well, may, not, maybe not first, but he may call me, yeah. He'll call you. <laughs> So, so the president sits there and says, well, Dr. Kissinger, I've got a lot of problems. One, I'm now president, okay? I'm, not pre I'm now president. I actually have to do this stuff. Uh, and we have this enormous and unsettled set of issues in the Middle East, of which you are an expert. We have Iran as a potential nuclear foe. Uh, president Bush, for, for whatever reason, has managed to get Korea more or less under control. Pakistan is a disaster. We've got wars in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. Take us through the conversation that you would imagine. What would you actually say if you got that call? When you, when you look at it today, with all of your, your insight. Uh, look, you have to understand what happens when you come into the White House. Uh, when you come into the White House, there are no files there. The outgoing president takes every document with him. Huh. So you have no record at all. <laughs> so you go to the bureaucracy and you ask them, please give me the files that you consider most important to my problems. It's fairly safe to predict that they will give you their best judgment, plus everything that's been turned down in the last year. <laughs> All the previous the proposals. They get a second shot at it. Uh, so you are overwhelmed with okay. papers and recommendations. You've got 150 countries around the world wanting to see the president to establish a personal relationship, and you've got congressional and media pressure. So you sit there uh, in, in the first few days uh, trying to keep from drowning. Now, in the Nixon period, he had thought a lot about foreign policy. For me, uh, my hobby was my work, so we didn't start from nothing. But what I would probably tell the president is, 
uh, what I would tell him now uh, uh, is your most important challenge will be not to let the urgent drive out the important. The urgent and the important. Separate the urgent things from the important things. And I would also say to him, now remember, when you're dealing with the bureaucracy, you're dealing with people who are in these jobs because they are dedicated. They are giving up a lot of money because they want to serve their country. So therefore, over the years, they've become experts in formulating propositions, which may be perfectly reasonable, but which will take you down roads that you may not want to, to follow a year from now. Uh, so if you can possibly contrive it, spend six weeks defining where you really want to go and where you, where you want to come out. Uh, and I think this is very important. It's especially important if somebody like Obama becomes president who hasn't been in any of these uh, uh, discussions previously. Because I would say about the immediate situation there, if you discuss it in terms of ending the war in Iraq, you're bound to fail. Because it involves Iran, Lebanon, Sunni, Shiite, eventually India. So you have to understand how these things fit together. Now, you can, well, of course, this is, everybody can disagree with it. My judgment would be actually that the paradox is that we can probably end it in two years if we don't set it as a deadline. And now, on the other hand, that's a tough problem for Obama since he's promised it. But leaving aside this particular issue, I would think the most important thing he can do for himself is to get clear where is he going. Yeah. Where are we going with Russia? In so much of the contemporary discussion, uh, Russia is described as getting ready to go into another neo-Stalinist period. I don't agree with that. I think they're not democratic. But I think that country has lost 300 years of its history and is trying to find a new definition of itself. But I'm not saying, I'm not arguing now that I'm right and others are wrong. I'm trying to say that if the president wants to come to a view of things, he ought to listen to different conceptual perceptions of the future and some tactical means of getting there. Otherwise, you jump into a decision and then in order to safeguard the decision, you get into an ever more complex situation and you lose sight about why you went in to begin with. I think a new president will have an unusual opportunity to construct a new international system because there's so many upheavals going on in so many different parts of the world that the art will be to relate them into some framework. It's a ch huge challenge, but it doesn't often happen in history that things are so fluid. Why don't we have a couple questions from the audience? Uh, and let me ask anybody who has questions to please make them brief as we're sort of running out of time. And I, there's a mic here and there's a mic over there. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> My question is related to the uh, Peace Nobel Prize that you were laureated. So first what? I want yeah. to uh, congratulate you for receiving the Peace Nobel Prize. 
I also want to note that scientists and uh, authors usually get the Nobel Prize a decade or two after their achievements, unlike many of the Peace Nobel Prize uh, laureates. And for that, I would like to ask you, uh, how does it feel to have the uh, Peace Nobel Prize for a deed that one of its uh, collateral damages was a uh, two million dead Cambodians. This was question. The question was, how does the one of the, the, the premise is that the Nobel Prize and the, all of that ultimately resulted in Cam, uh, deaths in Cambodia? Right. Uh, the. Uh, how did it feel to get the Nobel Prize is a separate question from the question you asked about the, uh, 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 the death in Cam Cambodia. Now, uh, there is a myth developing about Cambodia that is now common, sort of commonly accepted uh, I don't know, I don't believe it. there were two million dead, but that, that's not the issue. Whether it was a million or two million, it's not the issue. Let's begin with what is usually invoked when that sort of question is asked, which is the so-called secret bombing of Cambodia, right? That's what people, what you probably have in mind. Uh, now, what was the secret bombing of Cambodia? When the Nixon administration came into office, there had been an agreement to stop American bombing of the North uh, in return for restraints in uh, the war in South Vietnam. Uh, when Nixon was elected, but not yet sworn in, we had sent a message based on my negotiations in 67 to the Vietnamese saying that we were ready to negotiate in good faith uh, on the basis of justice to all sides. It doesn't mean anything, but it showed uh, goodwill. Within three weeks of Nixon coming into office, the, Vietnamese started an offensive in uh, South Vietnam uh, from bases that they had established along the Cambodian uh, border inside Cambodia uh, and had had established there for years. What made these bases especially lethal is because they were within 30 miles of Saigon and they would come across these uh, borders and uh, kill Americans. We suffered 500 dead a week. We suffered in one month nearly as many dead as we have in the six years in, uh, in uh, uh, Iraq. After we had had 2,000 to 2,500 dead, and while this was still going on, uh, Nixon uh, ordered the bombing of the base areas in, uh, in Vietnam. The base areas were about 10 miles wide and of different lengths. The judgment of all the experts was that there was next to no population in there. That judgment was supported by the ruler of Cambodia, who, when he was asked while the bombing of these base areas was going on, whether the Prince Sihanouk, whether this, uh, uh, how he reacted to these rumors of bombings, he said, these areas are in the control of what he called the Viet Minh, that meant the communist uh, Vietnamese. I don't know what's going on there. If even a bullock gets killed, I will protest, but I have had no reports. So the, 
the casualties in the uh, in the uh, base areas had to be uh, uh, very limited. Then the following year, the Vietnamese broke out of these base areas into Cambodia, and we then followed them with ground troops. In pursuit of that, they were probably casualties of the same proportion as they were in Vietnam. Uh, so it's, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know what the precise number of casualties was. But you have to ask this from, uh, what, what would you do had you been President of the United States? In 69, we faced 500 dead a week. In 70, we faced the prospect that all of Cambodia would become a, uh, a base area. We still had 500,000 troops there. We were withdrawing them at the rate of 100,000 uh, a year. And in the end, we succeeded in getting all but 20,000 out by 72. So it's possible to argue that mistakes were made. But the way this issue is usually put, that a bunch of immoral, warmongering characters, oblivious to human suffering, were dragging Cambodia uh, and, and killing Cambodians to pursue some nebulous objectives. That just isn't how it was perceived. And that is not the way most of the non-communist people in Southeast Asia uh, uh, perceived it. Uh, it uh, what happened to Cambodia is a tragedy. Most of it was caused by the, almost all of it, was caused by either the North Vietnamese communists or the Cambodian communists, was the American war always fought in the second phase, not in the secret bombing phase, with sufficient discrimination? Probably not, because military are a blunt instrument and we see it, uh, we, uh, we see it again. So another question that's implied by your question, should we have just quit and thereby uh, theoretically saved lives. Well, certainly more people were killed in Cambodia after the war ended than were ever killed during the war. Uh, and, uh, and also a very large number were killed. Secondly, you look at it from the point of view of a president. We have responsibility for the credibility of America around the world at a moment when the Cold War is still going on. Secondly, we have 400,000 Americans still left when the Cambodian crisis, second Cambodian crisis started. 400,000 Americans are still left. We had already withdrawn 125,000. They are surrounded by 900,000 South Vietnamese troops and about 800,000 North Vietnamese and guerrilla troops. And you start withdrawing them under those conditions, uh, which is an enterprise that we, we asked, uh, we were told it would take about 16 months to get that done. Uh, so. From that moment on, it took us about 24 months, 28 months, to end the war under conditions in which our casualties were constantly falling. And I think local casualties were constantly falling as well because they were a function uh, of the same. Our judgment was that we were saving, preserving the honor of America and the security of the world by the strategy we pursued. And you should also presume that it was 
a lot more painful to us than for people walking around with placards who didn't have to make the decision. That was our perception, and that's, uh, I, I think, the black hole in our understanding of what is going on in the world is our interpretation of the Vietnam War. We owe it to ourselves to come to an honest assessment. Of course mistakes were made, uh, but they were made by serious people trying to pre create a better international system, and we should learn from the mistakes. But it wasn't a question of throwing away $2 million so that somebody could win the Nobel Prize. Incidentally, normally, people get a Nobel Prize because they campaign for it. Uh, I didn't even know I was being considered for it, uh, so it was a big surprise to me when I got it. Well, thank you. Our next question. Um, in the in the vein of, of learning from mistakes and having serious people making decisions, um, I'd like to get your opinion on um, U.S. policy over the past, I don't know, decades that's been distorted by the importance of oil. And we have people in power who don't know much more than oil, and, and it's so important that they we're making all kinds of terrible decisions. So, so the, the, the premise here is oil is driving a lot of our foreign policy. Do you agree? Uh, yes and no. Uh, if the question implies, are the oil companies running foreign policy? Uh, I would say uh, basically no. Uh, Big companies know their commercial interests, and on issues that affect their balance sheet in the short, in the short term, one will hear from them. But most of them really don't know enough about the governmental process to affect it uh, in, in, on strategic issues. Uh, oil is important in the thinking because when you know that the energy supply that the world runs on, uh, uh, the industrial world runs on energy, who controls the energy supply is a matter of great importance. And uh, now I actually have come to the view and held the view even then that you cannot deal with that simply as a national effort, that you have to attempt to organize uh, the consuming countries into a common approach to access uh, to energy at one level. And secondly, I believe now, which uh, was not relevant in my period, that there are a number of problems in the world energy, environment, proliferation, climate, that rise above the normal calculations of uh, balancing state interests. And that one of the, cha the, uh, the uh, challenges of a new administration will be to find an international expression to that reality. Uh, but I don't think the war in Iraq was started by Halliburton. And, uh, it, and, but companies have their short-term interests, but not, I have not seen it affect the fundamental strategic decisions. They would affect commercial decisions. Well, Let, I, we're we're going to have to question, you know, what, would, what would oil not being important change? How would that change policy? If Basically. oil were not important, how would it change policy? It's very hard to answer. Uh, I think we should try to bring about a situation that reduces the importance of oil. Uh, if oil were not important, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran would be different phenomena in, in international affairs. And so the impact on 
not on any one company, but on the general uh, access to energy of the oil producing states, it's big. And ironically, sometimes disproportionate to their power outside the oil uh, uh, area. So, so if oil were not important, you'd have a shift we, we, in we the role of various countries. We've run over. Um, I, I wanted to have one more question, which will be yours, and this, unfortunately, will have to be our last question. So go ahead. As you may know, the presidential candidates have mostly come to speak at Google. One thing that they tended to agree on was that uh, it would be challenging for the next president to deal with the politicization of the civil service and of uh, the upper echelons of the military that has taken place um, in this administration. Is You've seen a number of administrations come and go. Do you think that is an accurate characterization um, by comparison to other administrations? No, I don't think. Uh I, I don't think that's an accurate uh, description. I've seen now every administration since Eisenhower. Uh, look, you have to look at it this way. The preferences of the president play a role in the thinking of the subordinates. And it's it's simply naive to think that that isn't the case. Uh, and so once it is known which direction it's going, the system sort of works to help produce it. So in that sense, a certain politicization is going on. But then you have to look at various departments, for example, you take the State Department. Uh, most Foreign Service officers believe that neither the President nor the Secretary of State could have passed the Foreign Service exam. So uh, that's exaggerated, but that's sort of their thinking. So their tendency is to keep pushing their preferences I mean, every president you've ever, whose memoirs you've ever read will complain about that. In the Pentagon, the services are commander in chief oriented. So, yes, they will try to get what he wants, provided it also fits some of, in, in, in other words, management of bureaucracy is a huge. Uh, task And if these candidates, when they were here, said, not the politicization, but to make the f bureaucracy, what we really need is a bureaucracy that develops a sense of the long-term national interest. And it's less driven. Uh, we spend so much of our time in our bureaucracy on the internal maneuvers of the bureaucracy that you forget what the purpose of the exercise is. Uh, I think, uh, and also sometimes uh, politics uh, play uh, a, uh, I mean, you take last year that national intelligence estimate about nuclear weapons in Iran. I don't know what they were thinking uh, because the evidence they gave they began by saying it is our judgment that they have stopped their nuclear weapons program. You had to read 20 pages to see that they were talking about warheads, uh, not about missiles, not about the whole program, and were not even sure about the warheads, but this had a huge political impact. So, in short, we need a let's politicize bureaucracy in a way, but not because they are ordered to think, but it is to harness their rivalries uh, and to lift their thinking. Uh, and that's a big assignment for a new president. Mr. Secretary, um, 
I think you've lived up to everything I described about you, the impact that you've had and the style and the insight that you've brought to government has been phenomenal and to us as well. So thank you very, very much for coming to Google. Thank you. Nice to see you.